like you to turn in your Bibles all the way almost to the end of your Bible to 2 John. There's only one chapter, so I can't tell you a chapter. Just go to 2 John. And I'm reading through the Bible, and I'm getting close to the end of the New Testament. I always finish the New Testament quicker than the Old Testament, so I just go back and start all over again. But I read this, and I just saw so much jumped out at me, and I want to bring it to you today and, and just talk about truth because there's so much misunderstanding of truth. And, and so I want to just talk to you today. And I'm going to begin at verse 1. I want to read verses 1 through 6. 2 John, verses 1 through 6. The elder, uh, that's what John was calling himself, the elder. John the elder to the elect lady and her children. Now I want you to notice how many times you see the word truth. Whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace and mercy and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Notice this verse, please. I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth. As we receive commandment from the Father... And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. How many of y'all know you ought to do what the Lord says to do? Right? Y'all believe that? Not just on Sunday morning, during the week when you're dealing with people. Yeah. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. All right, you can be seated this morning. I'm going to talk about walking in truth. A man asked three of his friends to tell him the meaning of the word truth. One of his friends was a psychologist, and so he said truth is what one feels it to be. There are a lot of people that believe that way today. His second friend was an accountant, worked with numbers. He said truth is what one needs it to be. His third friend was an attorney, a lawyer, and he offered that truth is what one can make it to be. What is truth? This is the question that Pilate asked Jesus just before he condemned him to die on a cross. What is truth? Some people think they know what truth is. I think the reality is most people are like Pilate and are clueless. I can tell you that truth is more than facts. Truth is more than that which can be scientifically verified. Truth is more than the essence of a matter. Truth is more than ethical postulation. We who are saved know what truth is. Because we know the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Very simply today, I offer to you that God is truth. There is nothing not true about him. I like to say that God is reality. Because by him all things consist, and in him all things exist, and We live and move and have our very being in God. So if you want to know what is real, what is reality, then you just look at God. Because without him, there is nothing. He is truth. He is the source of truth. And so consequently, this is very important. If he, listen, I didn't say he's true. I said he is truth. He is the personification of truth. It is his nature. It's it's. It's not what he has, it's who he is. We're going a little deep here, but are y'all with me? It's who he is. Okay, so since that is his nature, consequently, what he says is always what? True. 
The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. It's impossible for him. He cannot lie. He cannot say something that is not true. This is true in factual matters. It's true in moral matters. Have we got that settled? If you're going to believe in this divine being who is the only God, the true God, the living God, did you know to say the true God, and he's the God who is truth, then what he says has to be reality. So if he says something's right, are you all with me? Then it has to be right. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. If he says something is wrong, it doesn't matter what popular opinion is. It doesn't matter what people are saying on social media. It doesn't matter what some TikTok influencer is saying. It doesn't matter what people generally in America feel. It doesn't matter. If God, who is truth, says it's wrong, it's wrong. We have to get that settled if I go any further in this message. Yes, it's a presupposition because I'm preaching to believers. Let me ask you another question. Where do you get your truth? Now, if you want facts, you just get your phone and ask Siri. And she doesn't always get it right. My wife laughs at me because I try to use Siri and she fails me more than she helps me. And I'll just hit that little button. I'll say, hey, Siri. She'll say what? I say, you're so stupid. <laughs> and she'll say, that's not very nice. I don't like Siri. We, have, we do not have a good relationship. You want facts? You can do a Google search. All right, let me ask you another question. But where do you get your moral truth? What is your moral compass? Let me ask more questions. Preachers should ask more questions than the answer the question. Who or what helps you determine, helps you to determine, you, what is right and what is wrong. What authority in your life keeps you morally accountable, creates moral checks and balances, dictates or prohibits your actions, reactions, thoughts, and words? I'm asking you. Oh, yeah, I'm getting in your mess. You. I'm not preaching shotgun. Oh, no, baby, I got a rifle. I'm pointing at every one of you. I'm asking every one of you, what's your moral compass? Because everybody's got one in here. All you watching online, down south, the plural of y'all is all y'all. So all y'all got one. For all my Yankee viewers, the plural of y'all is all y'all. All y'all come here. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, saved from your sins, your moral authority is God and the Word of God. Because God's Word, your Bible, because it is God's Word, and I don't want to hear this stuff about, yeah, but man wrote it. Man just wrote down what God said. But it is true. God's word is true, and it's a reliable source of truth. In the Greek, the word truth literally means an unveiling, a revealing. It, that's what it implies, a revealing of something. When you learn the truth, it's, 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 uh, it's pulling back the curtain. In the Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the scarecrow and the cowardly lion stand before the great and terrible Oz. This holographic image in smoke and fire. And they're terrified. Little Toto the dog goes over and sees a curtain and grabs it. And he pulls back the curtain to reveal that the great and terrible Oz is just a huckster from Kansas. And isn't it interesting that we call the Bible divine revelation? And it is because it is a revealing of truth. 
God's word tells us about the God of truth and what he values and what he expects of creation. Y'all ever read the Psalms? Y'all ever get to Psalm 119? You know, you're just clipping along in the Psalms, and then you get to Psalm 119, and you go, oh, boy. And if you're wondering why, because it is the longest psalm. It's 176 verses. You don't read that one in one setting. You break that one up for a few days. Okay? 176. That's its distinction. Its other distinction is that it is thematic. The entire psalm from beginning to end, is built around this theme, the Word of God. Read it. Every, every verse is about the Word of God. And there are two presuppositions made by the writer. Presupposition number one is that God's Word is truth. Verse 142, your law is truth. 151, all your commandments are truth. Verse 160, the, I love this, the entirety of your Word is truth. That's a presupposition. The second presupposition is this. God's word is a necessary guide for right living. Some of these verses, those of you who grew up in church, you've heard these. Your word have I hidden in my heart, you know the rest of it, that I might not sin against you. That's right. You've learned that one. See, that's about right living. Your word, which is the source of of truth, your truth have I hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you so that I can live right. You know this one, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my, and a, see if you're in church, you know those. If your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. It shows me where to go. It shows me where not to go. And it shows me where to stay, how to stay on God's path and, and stay on the road to God. See, it's, it tells me how to live. And I said all that to say, it, that brings me to this little bitty letter that John wrote little second John, one chapter, and I read it, and I realize that John agrees entirely with the psalmist by telling us that God's word is truth and that God wants us walking in his truth. Walk in truth. If you read the Bible, you should. Walk, if you read the word walking, it's another way of saying living. Living. It's just about your lifestyle. So if it says walk in the Spirit, it means have a lifestyle of living in, you know, live in the Spirit. Be a spiritual person. And when it says walk in the truth, it, is, it means live your life according to what the Bible says. How's that? That's pretty simple. Live your life according to what the Bible says. Daily. It's how you deport yourself. So conduct yourself in the affairs of this life in ways that agree with what God says. In other words, how you live should match the truth of God's word. If this is God's word, then your life... Got it? Not this. Pastor Chris, you're just preaching so kind of elementary today. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Because this is fundamental. A child of God who has been born again, whose nature has been changed, who's become a partaker of the divine nature, who has been regenerated, born again, transformed, who is no longer being conformed to this world, but has been transformed by the renewing of our minds who has taken off the old man and is put on the new man, which is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We don't have a problem with this. Because we believe that moral truth originates and flows from the person of God. This makes truth objective, not subjective. Now let me talk to you for a little bit. For the last number of years, we and our children have been exposed through the arts, media, education, TV shows, podcasts, movies, books, 
to a view called postmodernism. Maybe you've studied this, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you've never heard of it in your life, but you need to. Postmodernism argues that there are no absolutes of any kind. They don't exist. And that there are no universal truths, none. They're all questionable. And there are no universal principles for good. I'm not making this up. This has been the prevailing view around the world for decades now. Kind of helps explain some things, doesn't it? Kind of helps you understand why are my kids tell, come home telling me some things. Why, do the, why is the news reporting some of that? Why do these talking heads say some of the things? that? Why, why are people just ditching authority like they are? It's because of postmodernism. So if you apply this now to God and the Bible and you talk about moral authority, then postmodernism says there is no moral authority and thus moral truth is subjective. It's not objective. It's subjective. What does that mean? What it means is what might be right for me may be wrong for you. And what might be wrong to me may be right for you. So I may say, oh, abortion's wrong. That's a killing of a human life. And you say, no, abortion is a woman's right. I believe it's okay. And we have people in the church that lean towards that other that because they're making truth subjective. So this is a church issue. And much of this is what has misguided a generation on what being tolerant means. The classical definition of tolerance is enduring, putting up with beliefs or practices that differ from your own. This kind of principle has been the bedrock of our constitution and our understanding of the freedom of speech. So you can believe and say what you want. I have to tolerate it. Because it's your right, but I don't have to accept it. And I sure don't have to believe it. But postmodernism, I'm not making this stuff up, created a generation that demands that my tolerance cannot exist with my absolute truth. I can't have it both ways. I have to accept the false moral truth of my neighbor as being equal with my own moral truth. We're both right. And I have to sacrifice my own moral truths. But I have to take it a step further because the new definition of tolerance is not only do I just have to put up with it, but in my head going, you're so stupid. In my head, I'm going, bless your heart. And if you... Any of our viewers who aren't from the South, bless your heart has two meanings. One, it really means you feel bad about somebody who's in a really serious situation. The other one means is you're so stupid. Bless your heart. You are so, bless your heart. You, you getting it? But the, the postmodernism, which has created a whole generation, we live with it now in America, is that not only do I just have to tolerate it, but I have to accept it. I have to validate it. I have to say it is, it is just as true as mine. Because the goal is, I don't want to make my neighbor feel bad. I don't, want, I don't want to judge my neighbor. I don't want my neighbor to feel uncomfortable. That's, that's why college campuses have little crying rooms. Yeah, I'm not making this up. For people who just can't handle it, and so they go to a room, they can, they can cry. Because they just can't handle that somebody is attacking their truth and not accepting their truth and validating their truth and being critical of their truth. Here's the problem. We have a problem. We have a problem. Absolute moral truth does exist. Because God exists. So murder is wrong because God is life. And lying is wrong because God is truth. And hate is wrong because God is love. See, so you don't even know if you can be absolute or not. Right now, some of you are saying, I don't know if I can be dog. You're so dogmatic, Pastor Chris. You're just dogmatic. You're just, you get up with all that histrionics, you Pentecostal. You're so bombastic. Just, 
I can't be that way. I just don't know. You're so dogmatic. You better be dogmatic about some things. You better be certain about what you believe. Because if not, this world will run over you like a big wheel truck. Because they think they know what they believe. Hmm. God and his word form a solid basis for my moral beliefs. And if those absolute truths make you uncomfortable because of moral issues, I have news for you. It is not because I'm making you feel bad or uncomfortable. It is because you practice sin and you advocate sin which contradicts the holy nature of God. My moral truths aren't your problem. Your sinfulness and your wrong standing with God is the problem because the reason you feel bad and you feel uncomfortable is called conviction. Conviction. That's what it is. I'm preaching to the choir. You're supposed to clap. People who disagree with me would be red hot. But I'm not worried about them. I'm not worried about them. What I'm worried about is you. Children of God. And I will not permit a warped, sinful culture or a warped, sinful society to dictate my moral compass. God in his word tell me how to live morally and ethically. Because God made me righteous through the atoning work of his son Jesus. And so I flesh out that righteousness by loving him and keeping his commandments. Did you know everybody in this room has a worldview? Everybody in this room has. Matter of fact, everybody in the world has a worldview. Did you know that? Well, some of you have probably heard this. You've studied this. Some of you maybe the first time you go, what? What? Not a rear view, a world view. A world view is the collection of attitudes and values and stories and expectations about the world around you. It's, how you, it's the lens through whom you see, through which you see. And these attitudes and values and stories and expectations, this collection of things as you perceive the world, inform your thoughts and your actions. In other words, your world view motivates how you live. So... If you have a, let me just be a preacher. I can't be anything else. Okay, I'm a preacher. All right? So if you have a worldly, godless worldview, that's how you see things, then you will most likely be worldly and ungodly. And you will live and speak and think like a worldly, ungodly person. However, if you have a biblical worldview. The Bible is what informs your thoughts and actions. You see the world through the lens of God. You look at things how God looks at things. Then most likely you're going to be a holy person and a godly person and you will think and live and speak like someone who has a saving relationship with God, who loves God, who is committed to God, who's committed to his word and your decisions will be based on what thus says the Lord. There is a verse of scripture in John 17. Look at this. Another point, I'm done. John 17, 17. You ought to highlight it, underscore it, put a big old star by it, whether it's electronically or in your hard copy Bible. Jesus is praying not just for the disciples. He's praying for you and me. Go read the context. It is a prayer for the believers in the future. That's us. Sanctify them through your truth. Your, well, you can't get much clearer than this. Your word is truth. Now, Jesus said the Bible is truth. Can't get much clearer than that when God declares his word is truth. And he said to the Father, sanctify. Sanctify is one of those, you know, we're a holiness church. Aren't y'all glad you're in a holiness church? I'm glad I'm in a hole in this church. We, we believe we ought to be holy even as God is holy. Okay, sanctify is one of those holiness words, and it simply means to separate. So if you take a dish out of the cabinet, just take one dish, and you take that dish out, 
and you go over here and you put it in a separate place by itself in another cabinet. You've sanctified it. You've set it apart from all the other dishes for some unique purpose. I want to tell you today that walking in the truth of God is a means of separation. You walk according to the truth, and there will be a distinction that will occur in your world. It will differentiate you from the students you go to school with and the co-workers you work with and the family members you live with and the neighbors in your neighborhood. They will look at you and say, he's not one of us. She's different from us. Living according to the truth will make you stick out in a crowd like a woman wearing a bright orange church dress at a funeral where everybody's wearing black. How's that for a comparison? You will stick out. Why? Because you're light and they're darkness. Your body is the temple of God. Theirs is the temple of the devil. You care about what God thinks. They only care about what their friends think, about what culture thinks, about what their Facebook friends think, about what social media followers think, about what college professors think. But here's the rub. Living according to the truth will make you unpopular. I'm going to say something. I don't know if I've ever said this preaching. But if your life's goal is to be liked by everybody, don't live for Jesus. Because it's impossible. You'll be talked about, laughed at, scorned, derided. It may cost you your job. I've known people it's cost them their job. Because they lived according to the truth. You may lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You may lose a lifelong friend. You may even suffer physical harm. But brothers and sisters, can I preach to this crowd today? Okay, that's the rub. But who cares? That's how you have to be. Who cares? Don't you ever give in to them. Don't you back down. You walk in the truth. Every day you obey God. Doesn't matter what they say about you. You press on anyhow. You ignore your persecutors. You close your ears to the voices screaming at you at social media. Say, Pastor Chris, how can I do that? I'll tell you how. Because they didn't give their life for you. They didn't die on an old rugged cross for you. They didn't wash your sins away. They didn't pull you out of a devil's hell. They didn't transform your life. They didn't change you from an alcoholic to a sober person. There's only one person that did that, and his name is Jesus. And you are owe him everything. You owe him your life. Don't you back down. You stand up for Jesus who did everything he did for you. Somebody give God praise in this house. I have one point and I'm done. Musicians, you better hurry. We got too many posers in the church. That's the problem. We got too many posers. A poser is somebody who presents themselves as one thing, but they're not. They're not really what they propose they are. I read a story that I think illustrates this a bodybuilder. It ain't me. I'm a body crumbler. I feel like. You wait till you get 57. Bodybuilder went to visit a tribe in Africa, African tribe. Tribal chief talked with him. He was amazed at all the muscles. He said, what do you do with all those muscles? He said, I think it would be better to show you than try to explain to you. He started flexing. He's flexing his biceps and his triceps. He's flexing his obliques, chest muscles, back muscles. He's flexing them all, just you know how they do. 
tribal chief just standing there amazed. He said, well, what else can you do with them? <laughs> and you know what the guy said to him? He said, that's pretty much it. He said, I work out to pose. You know what the tribal chief said to him? Well, then what a waste. And you come to church, and you read your Bible, and you pray, and sometimes you fast, and you give your tithe, and if some of you volunteer, and we get a little gold chain with a gold cross around our neck, and we got our daily Bible reading on our app. But when you get to work tomorrow, are you walking in the truth? When you come to the moral forks in the road, are you walking in the truth? When you could ream out a customer and say some choice words that you'd never say in front of me, by the way. It's interesting how you've got that one figured out. Are you walking in the truth? Oh, you ain't going to amen me, but I don't want an amen. Because I'm all up in your stuff. Because that's my job. And I love you the whole time. So you can't get mad at me because I love you so much, you don't know what to do with it. I'm like your grandpa. You can't hate grandpa. Because I give you quarters for bubble gum at the store. too many people just posing but when you get out there in the real world when you get home does your wife, husband see something different than what I see are your kids seeing and hearing something different than what I see and hear kids are your parents seeing something different I'm not trying to make you feel bad, feel guilty because that's what it sounds like doesn't it, it sounds like boy, what a mean preacher, bad preacher very bad man Jerry Seinfeld did. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just telling you, God's commandment. This is strong preaching today, okay? If you want happy preaching, come back next Sunday. I'll probably preach on being thankful, and that'll be happy preaching. But today, no. Straight preaching. God's commandment is that you walk every day in the truth. It's hard. It's hard sometimes. Because you have propensities and proclivities and there are weak links in your chain and the strong areas you don't have a one bit of problem with but you get in that one area, two area where you struggle. Do I, am I not preaching where we live? Because I got them too. I wanted to throw a golf club this week. I was with an elder of the church and another man does go to my church and I couldn't throw that club but I wanted to throw, I wanted to break a club. Oh, it was all. Why didn't you do it? Lots of reasons. But one of them is because dead gummit, I got to walk in the truth. I have to deport myself like Jesus. And Jesus wouldn't chunk his pitching wedge across the golf course. Am I preaching where you live? Or are y'all all, all holy and I'm the only one here? Stand with me. What I know. What I know. I feel the Holy Ghost because I'm about to talk about him. What I know is God doesn't stick me out on a limb all by myself and say, now do this, good luck. But when I got saved, he took his Holy Spirit and placed him inside of me. Mm, my God, I felt a surge of glory just shoot through me right there. I know it's hard and I know my flesh fights and so does yours, but I've got someone, not something, I've got someone Woo, inside of me. They can, if I got a Holy Spirit, I can live holy. 
If I've got a holy Jesus, I can be like Jesus. If I've got the spirit of truth living inside of me, I can walk in the truth. I'm preaching right now. You just don't know it. And because of the spirit of God inside of me, I can rise above whatever tries to stop me. And I can, whatever I'm facing, whoever's, whoever's pushing my buttons, whatever temptation is luring me, I'll just lean on the Holy Ghost. I cannot walk in the flesh, but I can walk in the spirit and I can walk in truth.